I'd like to request uh, that we have the aisle entirely empty. And some quick announcements before we start with the session. Please don't leave your bags unattended at the festival and let us uh, help us in keeping it as clean as possible. Um, please, please subscribe to the Jaipur Literature Festival YouTube channel to access all the sessions in case you can't be in two places at once. Please uh, tweet using Jaipur Literature Festival 2023. That's hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2023 and tag us at, at the rate Jaipur Lit Fest if you're posting on Twitter or Instagram or on LinkedIn. I see people are still trickling in. I'm going to give them for 10 seconds and then we'll start. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar Adab. Welcome to the 16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Dettol, Baniga Swast India at Bank of Baroda, Charbagh. We are delighted to introduce seven moons of Mali Almeida. Mali Almeida has only seven moons to contact his two loved ones and guide them to photographs that will change the fate of Sri Lanka. A war photographer, gambler and closet gay, Mali is exposed to the fleeting nature of life by his sudden death and wishes for his photographs to be a legacy for his country. In a race against time, Mali reaches out to his loved ones in an attempt to expose the visceral brutality of war in a session in a session with Nandini Nair, Booker Prize winner, author, Shehan Karunatalika, Shehan Karunatalika <laughs> delves into his latest tales of pathos, humor, and satire, and the grave dangers of collective amnesia. Can we please have both of you on stage and a huge round of applause for the Booker Prize winner. Shehan Karunatilika, yeah, may I, uh, <laughs> thank you. Shehan Karunatalika is the author of the Seven Moons of Mali Almeida, which won the Booker Prize 2022. He has also authored the Commonwealth Book Prize winning Chinaman. Sorry, she, Shehan Karunatilika. I don't know, I'm, I think it's the first session, so Shehan Karunatalika, is it right? Is it right, sir? It's close enough, it's fine, yeah. <laughs> My name has been mangled all over the world, this is, this is good. <laughs> Thank Shehan you. Shehan Karunatalika. Thank it's you. Ma'am, are you good too? <laughs> <laughs> He's also authored the Commonwealth Book Prize winning Chinaman, The Legend of Pradeep Matthew, and a short story collection titled The Birth Lottery. He has also published several children's books. Nandini Nair has been a journalist for more than 15 years. She's the literary and cultural editor of Open Magazine. She's previously worked as a writer and commissioning editor in the feature section of the Indian Express and the Hindu. I hope you guys have a great session. Nandini, ma'am, to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for a full house as well. And first and foremost, Shehan, congratulations. I know you've heard this many times, but a booker is a big achievement and we're so glad to have you here. Um, so the Thank you very much. Yeah. It never gets old. Or it hasn't yet. yet. <laughs> uh, so that was going to be my first question, actually. Um, so the Booker was announced in October 2022. Um, how much has life changed since then? And also, how tired are you? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm well rested today, uh, well hydrated. And yeah, the, the sun's out. And uh, no, uh, I've, I've got into a pattern now. But yeah, this, this journey is just beginning. And I suppose the strangest thing is uh, people want to talk to you. And uh, I've, I've um, cultivated this air of being unapproachable all my life. And then now, uh, yeah, so and the mornings I wake up to uh, a gazillion emails and uh, I eventually answer. And so it's strange because you're used to sitting in a room talking to no one hardly talk to your kids or wife, you're talking to yourself and to ghosts and, um, and that's kind of where you're most content and then, um, yeah, everyone wants to talk to you and then, uh, uh, so I'm getting used to that and I'm, getting, and I'm not writing that much but uh, I, I met the great Damon Galgut uh, at the South Bank, uh, there was a sort of handover event and uh, he looked exhausted and he said, and he said, my life has been one lit fest after another and he said, my friend, um, 
you will uh, you won't write another word for the next 12 months but just just enjoy it and and go with it so uh, but it's just beginning but yeah i'm trying to stop being uh, not be exhausted and uh, get into the flow of it yeah so have you written anything since october yeah I, i'm doing a kids book about insects and i'm oh, quite wow. fascinated about insects and uh, so i've been doing that uh, on and off. Uh, but yeah, a third novel was started earlier this year because The Seven Moons was done last December and you kind of let it go and moved on. But uh, yeah, it's been a whirlwind year for yeah myself and Sri Lanka. And so, yeah, those are, so there's, there's stuff to, to write, but I think for now I'll be holding a microphone for a while. Yeah. Mm. Um, so Seven Moons has had many versions and revisions. Um, it was Chats with the Dead in 2020 when it was released in India. And you have spoken about how editors have sort of helped you mold the book and make it this form. Um, I think you mentioned somewhere how the difference between Chats with the Dead and Seven Moons is you were sort of making it more accessible to a global audience. Uh, but the wonderful thing about this book is that it still has a very authentic flavor. So how do you do both? How do you sort of universalize it but also keep it very true to yourself so you're not thinking about these these things when you're you're in colombo writing about either left arm spinners who no one's heard of or um dead ghosts uh, in a war that you know maybe no one remembers and so you you're writing for a reader like yourself uh, and you think it may connect with a subcontinental audience because we've shared similar histories and absurdities and and so that's how and yeah before chats with the dead it was a slasher horror called devil dance which um uh i someone should write it because i thought it was a good idea but yeah 10 aid workers on a bus going down tsunami ravaged um sri lanka and i remember i i got into that whole uh, yeah, and one by one they meet accidents and I couldn't, I couldn't save that draft for various reasons, but the only thing that survived was the ghost on the bus, Mali Almeida. And then I thought, okay, so what if I write from the ghost's point of view? And then it took me to this idea of what if Sri Lanka's dead could speak? And, um, and that seemed a nice premise for a ghost story. But yeah, Chats with the Dead was done, and that was what it was, Mali Almeida going through the afterlife. Um, interviewing the various victims and uh, people whose murders haven't been solved and so on. But then it, it struggled. It, it really struggled. I mean, it, um, in the subcontinent, uh, it got published and there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. I think because Chinaman has become a bit of a cult book in the subcontinent. But um, elsewhere, every, um, even publishers who um, uh, were had published Chinaman before, who liked the book, were saying, this is very confusing. Um, we, and I guess we take for granted things like demons and pretas and rebirth and yakas and all that, but uh, that needed some explanation. How does this afterlife work? And also, it was a complex political situation in 1989. Um, so who are the LTT? Who's the JVP? Who's the Indian peacekeeping force? What are they all doing? And who's doing all this killing? And so I think that was the initial uh, brief that, Let's and once we found a sort of books who I just had an editorial relationship with, with Natanya Jans, who I owe everything to, she was like, initially, okay, let's just make it easy for, and I think that's the mark of a, a decent book is that you should be able to pick it up anywhere in the world, whether you know about Sri Lankan left arm spinners or not, and you should have an experience with it. And so in, that was the initial brief to make it easy, well, accessible. And there's some cheat sheets at the beginning, just like in Chinaman, there's, uh, first 50 pages tell you what a bat and a ball is. This sort of uh, simplifies it. But the thing was also mm, pandemic. And so it's not going to come out in 2020. It'll come out in 2021. And so now we have nine more months. And so let's try and fix this ending, which is a bit confusing. And the beginning, which uh, kind of drags. And the middle, which goes off. But other than that, it's great. These are some genuine notes I got. <laughs> Terrific work, but let's fix all these things. And then we pulled out characters. So we just... An editor and a writer left with uh, two years, um, and we just kept tinkering more and more. But I think, yeah, initially that was what it was, just to make it accessible. Uh, as you mentioned, this book sort of has a lot of terms that we in the subcontinent might be familiar with, Booth, Breath, uh, and all of that. So what have you learned about the afterlife with this book? <laughs> what have I learned? Um, so I have to report, um, I haven't seen a ghost, and I've gone to many haunted houses, uh, yeah, visited clairvoyance. 
I, I stopped short of doing a seance because I've watched too many horror movies. You know how that trope works out. A uh, writer researching a book does a seance. Um, and it was a problem because uh, most ghost stories, um, you don't meet the ghost till the third act. And depending on the special effects budget, it's a good movie or a bad movie, depending on that. But it's um, the best, the, the most chilling horror movies, you don't see the ghost at all. But this, you see the ghost on page one who says, hi, I'm a ghost and is talking to you in the second person. So I had to visualize what this afterlife or what the rules are and how they navigate. And it took a while um, because, you know, you read the religious texts and uh, philosophers, what their theories are and um, near death experiences. So that's, um, I mean, that's, that's well documented and this idea of seeing the light and walking into the light, that, that trope also exists across the Judeo-Christian religions. But um, in the end, I realized, you know, you can't interview a ghost. You can't, uh, uh, you, yeah, so you can, and no one knows anything. And um, so therefore, I, I had to construct it. And this idea that the afterlife is a bureaucracy, it just seemed like a bad, uh, you know, uh, absurd enough idea that, because we have this illusion, and I guess it's wish fulfillment that, when you breathe your last, you close your eyes and you open them, everything will be revealed and uh, the universe will uh, unfurl at your feet and God will reveal her name to you and you'll be... But you know, that, it seemed more likely to me that you wake up with a piece of paper saying go over to that counter and get it stamped and then go, go over there and confess your sins and then you need to get the final approval from God but God hasn't, has gone to lunch and hasn't been back for like a few millennia, uh, and so wait in line, and this idea that the spirit, and it was a possible explanation for why Sri Lanka ends up from in catastrophe to cat catastrophe. Um, I mean, there's many, there's many theories, a lot of supernatural theories, but one is that there are all these restless spirits who don't know which counter to go to, and they are whispering these bad thoughts in people's ears. But what have I personally found? Um, I mean, I don't particularly want to see a ghost, and uh, I, I. Um, I don't know, I guess it's, it's all there in the book, and I, I hope I'll be able to report back uh, when, when we... I mean, we'll all find out. We'll all find out, so I, I don't know. I don't want to reveal the ending. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the wonderful thing about the book is that there is this humor, but there's also... Uh, you're dealing with Sri Lanka of 83 and Sri Lanka of 89, when terrible things happened. Um, and I think, like the introduction as well mentioned, this is a book against collective amnesia, about how we tend to forget events of the past and just move on. So I want to talk about this battle against amnesia and also about not just um, collective amnesia and sense of time, but also place, because you have this wonderful paragraph how people living in Colombo forget what's happening, that's just a bus ride away. Um, so about from collect how we tend to forget, yes, uh, something that's in the neighborhood, but because we are kind of, you know, smoking our cigarettes and having our drink, we tend to look it over. Yeah, so, I mean, you're asking about uh, the, yeah, collective amnesia and the Colombo bubble, which uh, I guess they, are, they do intersect. Um, I think that was the central theme of the book. Um, and also, w when I approach this, I, I still see myself as a genre writer. I think the first one was a detective story, and this is a, this is a murder mystery. And um, it, was, it started off as an amnesia tale. So the ghost wakes up, doesn't know how they died, and then recollects different uh, memories. And I guess then it might have become a revenge tale, and perhaps it becomes a love story, but it, it shifts. But I think the central thing there is, and I think this is a question that Sri Lanka goes through and is going through, is... Um, do we, do we bury our past or do we dig it up and scrutinize it? And um, Sri Lanka is not good at doing that. It just seems like, for instance, the Easter attacks, which seems like ancient history now. It was uh, three, four years ago. But again, there are a lot of narratives and theories about that, but it doesn't get spoken about because now we're dealing with the catastrophes of 2022 and 2023. And with Mali also, he has, I mean, there's two very obvious characters, uh, uh, Dr. Rani and... Um, Sena Patirana, the sort of angel and the demon, and one is saying, your life is done, just make peace with it and walk into the light and move on. And the other is saying, no, that's exactly what you shouldn't be doing. Karma is just another tool of the ruling uh, celestial powers and they just want you to forget so that nothing changes, but you need to go back and uh, make sure justice is done. And this is the thing that Mali uh, wavers between. Um, and I guess, I mean, 
there's clues in the book and finally you find out where he ends up going. But and this is a problem that Sri Lanka grapples with. But the Colombo bubble was something I could relate to and I still do. Um, so I was a teenager uh, when the events of this book was happening and um, I wasn't politically aware at all and we sort of went on with our lives. There were cricket matches, there were parties and so on while this terrible war was happening almost in another place. And, um, and I suppose we all grew up with that guilt because then later in life you meet people who grew up in Jaffna in Trincomalee who were in the plantations during the JVP insurrection and who bore the brand and who had much more harrowing experience than, than I did. And I guess the difference was Mali Almeida felt that guilt and wanted to do something about it and also he had his ego about being a photographer and, and so on. So what, whatever his reasons, he went and did something. I just stayed at home and played video games and only wrote novels about it 30 years later. But I think this, this, this idea still exists. Like Sri Lanka is, uh, even though it's a lot more stable than it was six months ago, um, it's still got a lot of challenges ahead. And I think if you were there in December, the tourists were back and celebrating New Year and that uh, uh, phallic symbol in Colombo was lit up during electricity crisis. And uh, so this idea that Colombo keeps going while the rest of the country... So I think uh, that was a central thing in this book. And this was how Mali Almeida dealt with it. But of course, he got himself killed. Um, you've mentioned before about how, as an author, uh, you like to tap into Sri Lanka's absurdities. Um, and recently there was this wonderful photograph of water cannons being shot at a crowd and the protesters decided to shampoo their hair in it. Um, and, and that seemed uh, something which I feel you would kind of pick up on as well. So can we talk about um, the, you know, the trove of absurdities and also how Sri Lanka manages to maintain its optimism? Yeah, it's a strange one, and there have been, uh, every week there are absurdities, and um, yeah, and, and that's a perfect example. You remember this, um, so the Aragalea was this wonderful unifying moment, but it was also very, very scary for us watching from a safe-ish distance was that you have heavily armed guard and these kind of, these young people predominantly trying to, and, uh, but when it happened, the images we got were people belly flopping into the pool and watching the cricket on the president's couch. Uh, and um, it, it, the strange thing was, even during the economic crisis and then what followed after that were the petrol queues and the shortages. And um, the jokes kept flowing. And I think the Twitter and the social media has a lot to do with that. Um, in that, in one way, the media and the politicians can't, they don't have sole ownership of the narrative whatever they try to share, even on these mediums, gets mocked. And, and yeah, the way the memes come up, I remember, yeah, I mean, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Poya, and I think uh, a member of the, uh, the family that shall not be named. I, I'm, I'm going to, like Lord Voldemort, that's what I'm going to use. You're not going to, but um, said, may the, may the triple gem bless all, uh, all Sri Lankans. And then the comments just uh, piled on saying, I'm surprised you guys haven't stolen the triple gem by now. And um, the, even the petrol queues, I mean, there, were, uh, there was tension and arguments, but also people sitting there playing cards and cracking jokes and, um, and yeah, sharing these lame jokes on WhatsApp. And I think this seems to be something, perhaps it's our national character, certain, perhaps it's even my sensibility that, um, if you, write, if you write about 89 without access to humor, it, it's a pretty grim tale. I mean, I think if you go to the actual history, uh, it's far more gruesome than anything in the book. So maybe this is our coping mechanism that we use humor. And it's, I mean, it's not to trivialize it. I think it's a powerful weapon because uh, a dictator who was feared and you did not speak up against, suddenly people were mocking him on online and opening the street and sometimes when you make fun of power you you are able to take away something from it and uh, and so that's why this was such a unique and surprising event and so i think maybe this uh, you know either we laugh at each other or we kill each other so i guess we're opting for the safer option and uh, yeah um, you mentioned about how the violence at that time was very disturbing. Um, and I think Mali's photographs are sort of witness to that. Um, and I think 
for example, Black July, there are horrific photographs of that time, which are still available online. Um, so can we talk about how you kind of recreated that? Were you looking at the images of that time? Because I think there's one picture that you do particularly mention about yeah. a man sitting and the devils dancing around him. Um, and I saw that photograph and it's, it's horrible. Um, and also, what was it like to recreate that time of, from these very stark images? Well, I think not enough photographs, I would say, because um, now 83, um, I don't know if we even have an official death count. Uh, we certainly no memorial, certainly no apology for it. And, but now with the internet, every July, we have commemorations about Black July, but it's the same three photographs that keep getting recycled. And I wonder for the scale of the atrocities that happened, where were the photographers? Where were all these incidents that we hear about? And, and I think the same goes for the war as well. We, I, I, I came across one book by uh, Victor Ivan, uh, Paradise in Tears, which is out of print. And it, it had a lot of unseen photographs from the JVP insurrection. And, uh, and there's the work of Stephen Champion as well. So there's a few photographers uh, around. And I find out that William Dalrymple was there as a young man with his, uh, with his camera. I, I wasn't aware of that, that he had a secret life as a Mali Almeida, I would have uh, yeah, tapped his research as well. But um, for me, I feel, and this is where collective amnesia comes in, because um, are the kids reading this book now born after 89? Are they aware of 83? It's, I'd be astonished if it was being taught in schools. We're taught about uh, kings from 2,000 years ago and our colonizers. I don't know if we're taught the last 30, 40 years. So this idea that maybe they are, these photographs are somewhere under someone's, in a box under a photographer's bed, that was just an enticing thing. But I just felt there must be more photographs. There must be, uh, these things happen. And Mali also sort of naively, idealistically believes. And that's his quest after death. He's less interested in solving his own murder. He's more interested in saying, if these pictures are seen, it'll do, as he says, what Napalm Girl did for Vietnam which is not much, that war uh, raged for a few more years after that. And, but he thinks that if, if people could see the, the Colombo bubble especially, see the scale of the atrocities, then these things will stop. Um, so I don't know if I was recreating, I was imagining based on uh, red anecdotes and stuff, I was imagining stuff, but um, yeah, I felt that there wasn't enough. And I think this is essential, especially now when we're memorializing these things on the internet. I think photographic evidence. Well, now, that's the thing. The Aragalea, someone writing a novel about the Aragalea is not going to have a problem. Everyone had their camera. Everyone's a walking camera now. Uh, but uh, at that time, not so, there wasn't that many Amali Almeidas, I guess. Um, so Mali is an interesting character because he's an atheist, he's a nihilist, but also he does believe that his photographs can topple governments. Um, and so what was it like kind of creating this ambiguous character um, who... I think he describes himself as someone who's at the wrong place, but with a camera in hand. Um, and that's kind of his USP. Yeah, so he, numerous times when we're editing it, um, the comment comes back from readers, uh, Mali's not very likable. I, I, yeah, and, and I, we sort of address that, but you know, I question, does the character need to be likable for the book to be compelling? I mean, I think... WG in the first one was a, he's someone I'd like to sit and have an arac with. I don't know if I'd want to hang out with this guy. Uh, but, and getting to his character, I just, so I went through phases previously where I do these big character bios, five pages, what do they like to have for lunch and uh, uh, what's their uh, favorite movie and, and all of that. With, and you know, you end up doing character bios and not writing the book. And um, with, with this, um, I just knew one, okay, so he, he, was a, he was a gambler, and um, he was a closeted gay man, he was a promiscuous gay man, uh, and um, that he had this one thing that he believed he was really good at. Um, and I didn't go in with much more information. I, I also, um, when I started it, I was researching the victims of 89, and there were three fairly famous ones, and one was uh, Richard de Soisa, who was, he wasn't a war photographer, but... Uh, he was more of an activist and a theater person, and um, yeah, I was murdered in 89, but he was also a closeted gay man. And so I kind of began there, but later you just sort of problem solve and you think, so why is this guy going to these dangerous places? But one reason is uh, in Colombo, he couldn't express himself sexually, so he can go, go to the war zone and, and be freer there. 
and um, but also this idealism that that comes with it. But I don't know if I sat down and made a list. He's a nihilist. He's an atheist. It just it made more sense because after he'd seen all these things, he was convinced there was no order to this universe. There is no deity presiding over it. It's just the random roll of the dice, like in the casino. And he had he had formed this world view, and then suddenly he finds himself in the afterlife in this absurd situation. So I think you get in there, and then you find out how the character uh, negotiates it. But I think in the end, you do see a bit of heart to him. So there is he. At the beginning, he's this wise-cracking. Um, smart ass who thinks he had, has it all figured but i think there is a bit of heart to the story uh, uh, towards the end uh, but yeah he just revealed himself gradually i didn't i didn't sit down and contrive it yeah uh, talking about random roll of the dice um, I, it's interesting because i think the one phrase that occurs in your in seven moons more than once is lottery of birth or birth lottery and your next collection of short stories also has that title um, so what does that phrase mean to you <laughs> Well, I, I and I'm a terrible gambler as well. I I, I play poker, but I yeah, I don't have a poker face. You'd think otherwise. And but I, I was fascinated by the guys who are really good at it. How they sit there, you know, calculating pot odds and outs and ins and all this stuff. And um, um, the birth lottery was just it, the idea came to me talk, talking. So you know, in Sri Lanka in Colombo, we have these these schools that have been around for 100 plus years, Royal and St. Thomas's who play that famous cricket match, and then there's bishops and St. Bridget's and ladies and so on. They are, they are, and these people who go to these schools are very proud. Some of them, I mean, are very, very proud. They put stickers, I'm proud to be a Thomian, I'm proud to be a Josephian. And when you talk to them, they go, um, yeah, yeah, that, that guy, I know him, he's a Thomian. Uh, we can do it. And, and, to the extent that they do, there is a fair bit of looking down on other schools. And I'm thinking, you're congratulating yourself over a decision made when you were five years old, which you had no part in whatsoever. And yet you act like the, you, this is the badge you carry. And um, um, it also occurred to me writing this that I could have been born, instead of being born in Gaul uh, and growing up as a Sinhalese Buddhist, I could have been born just a bus ride away in Jaffna. And if I was uh, in my 20s, in the 90s in Jaffna, my life would have turned out very differently. And again, I can't, you can't congratulate yourself over this. These are lotteries of, lotteries of birth. So that, that idea, it's certainly there in Mari Almeida. But uh, yeah, I think you'll see it in the short stories as well, the random roll of the dice. And, and again, yeah, nabbing a Booker Prize, it's a one in six chance. That's the roll of the dice. Uh, it's one in 14 before. It's one in who knows what. Mali can, and so you accept the lottery when it, when it comes your way. And, uh, try not to be too upset when it doesn't, and most times it doesn't. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Rani Sridharan earlier, and she's a fascinating character in the book because she's this woman in the white sari who's sort of a guide uh, for Mali in the afterlife. Um, she is based on a real character, and uh, recently I think in the Hindu there was a beautiful article by her daughter, um, and it was just about reading about her mother in this fictional book. Um, so what is it like when you are c writing real people in fiction. Yeah, so that was a wonderful gift. And you're, you're never sure. Because um, in an early draft, I got told off by a Gratian Prize judge uh, saying that, you know, if you're writing about Richard DeSoisa, write a bio. Uh, or if you're doing fiction, do fiction. Don't do this flimsy uh, uh, mixing of fact and fiction. It's just lazy. And uh, But the thing is, for my first book, I did exactly that. You know, I, and I thought I was being clever. I had... Uh, cricketers called Hashan Mahanama and uh, uh, Aravind Ranatunga, thinking I was being so uh, sneaky. And then the lawyers who had a read of it, they said, well, you know, you're, now you're pissing off two people rather than one. And, uh, but they said, don't worry, getting sued by a famous cricketer is great for, for sales. And, uh, and none of those things happened. But I guess here it's a bit more tricky because you're dealing with people who died. And, um, and so I did... And I don't think, I mean, Dr. Rani Sridharan, I don't know how close she is to Dr. Rajini, but I did read and uh, watch all of uh, Dr. Rajini Thiranagama's work and so on. But yeah, to then have her daughters who were young girls when this happened, and I've, you know, I've watched their interviews and so on too, because it could have gone quite wrong. It could have gone the other way, and then what do you say? So that, yeah, that was a, a very moving thing. And uh, even the... 
1983 Royal Tomi and the Royal Cricket Team, who I lampooned in Chinaman, they were all quite flattered to be uh, lampooned uh, that way. So that, so some, yeah. I suppose with cricket, it's a lot more uh, innocuous, and uh, people are less likely to take offence. Though that's not necessarily true. But um, yeah, this was this. I mean, I this was during the Booker madness, and this this tweet happened, and I I got in touch with Sharika and Narmada, and uh, yeah, it's just such a wonderful. I mean, that's the best feedback you can get, but um, I don't know if I, I just, I went by instinct and they're saying, yeah, my, my mom was just bossy like Dr. Rani was. I, I, I had no way of knowing that, but uh, yeah, these are the magical moments that happen, I think. Um, I'm, I want to leave enough time for questions, but um, I know that I'm privy to certain secrets and that you have a theory about facial hair and great literature. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The facial hair question, you pulled that out. Um, what is my theory? I, uh, so you need to have facial hair to write great literature? You had a theory, and about how... <laughs> well, I mean, Jane Austen didn't, didn't sh she didn't have facial hair. Margaret Atwood, they've written better books than I could ever. Um, um, well, I, I do remember uh, in the 90s, um, we had a thing called alternative rock, I don't know, and people were alternos, alternative, so basically the, I guess the, what are they called now, hipsters, or maybe that term's also gone, but I remember in, at, I went to university in New Zealand, and they had, um, um, yeah, you had the alternos with the piercings and the dreadlocks, and then you had the rugby heads who uh, played rugby, and, and I remember this rugby guy wanted to come to the, it was called The Stomach. Uh, it was a place where you had five bands for five bucks and wanted to come in and, and he came and I was like, what do you want to come here for? And he, then he looks at all these weird freaks and he says, look, I'm alternative here, you know, you guys are all conformists. And I, I didn't have an answer for him. I, and I thought, oh really, you pretended to be my friend just so you could deliver that punchline. But, but I thought about it later and I realized, yeah, it is. We're just saying, okay, we belong to this tribe rather than that tribe. And I think the facial hair thing is, I mean, I got into advertising because I could wear a t-shirt and grow my hair long. And um, I think maybe it's, m all my characters have daddy issues and uh, it comes from a place. And, you know, my dad telling me that, you know, now you've got to cut your hair, wear a tie uh, and, and get a job. And so kind of proving uh, to people that, you know, I don't need to put a noose around my neck. I can grow my uh, grow my hair and uh, grow my beard. So I think it's more that, you know, you see Tolstoy and Dickens and you think, okay, I can belong to that tribe, even though I'm writing lies for a living. It's the people who actually have to lie for, you know, lawyers, politicians, uh, account directors. They have to clean shave because you, and I don't have to do that. And so I think it's, it's more that. Uh, but great literature, yeah, I think you can have no hair and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's a correlation. No, because um, you were asked what was the question that you wish you'd been asked and you said about your hair care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So we're there. I think I just wanted to talk about the stomach in, in the 90s, yeah. Um, um, so I'm going to do a quick word association with you. Um, oh no. Um, <laughs> what, one word? Uh, a couple of words. I'll need at least a paragraph, okay. but um, okay. Let's see. I so you're testing my vocabulary, vocabulary on stage. On stage. Winning a booker wasn't good enough. We it's, only uh, have a I, 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 okay. <laughs> we have two fine. minutes, so it's fine. Okay, okay. Let's okay. Go. So the first one, Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt, Uncle Kurt. Um, <laughs> one word? Um, <laughs> so look, I can't. Uh, Uncle Kurt is who I owe everything to uh, in terms of when you want a drunk uncle, tone of voice, someone who can... Talk about depressing things like uh, man's meaninglessness of existence and the fact that we're going to destroy our, each other uh, and the planet and do it in a hilarious way. Sorry, this is not rapid fire by any <laughs> chance, but yeah, Uncle Kurt. I'll just say Uncle Kurt. Uh, rock and roll. Rock and roll. We're on a rock and roll stage. Um, is it still called that? Uh, I don't know. I, say I played in a rock band and yeah, my kids asked, what was that? Is that... They use things like guitars. Um, yeah. I, I still have the nostalgia for it. The algorithm says that I listen to dad rock and yacht rock. <laughs> I was very... I thought dad rock was like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, but no, dad rock is Nirvana and Pearl Jam. That's what... But yeah. No, no. Rock and roll may... It's kind of dead or in a coma, but it may rise again. Yeah. Fatherhood. Fatherhood. Uh, difficult to write books. Um, 
but it's getting better now. Um, I thought it would be a bad idea. Uh, I think it, it, it has been a great idea, but it uh, takes seven years to write Seven <laughs> Moons because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, literature festivals. Huh. Microphones. Um, some are more equal than others, and uh, we're at the very best, and uh, it's wonderful, but um, yeah. Lovely, passionate readers, and um, you know, you can't complain about it. It's wonderful, but it is tiring. Yeah. Uh, next book? Um, not about cricket, not about ghosts, certainly about Sri Lanka and definitely about absurdity. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to open this out to questions. I can see lots of hands. Um, I can see a green sweater hand right over there. Uh, Yes. Uh, so the question was, can you explain the diversity of your books? Yeah, uh, from, from Seven Moons to Where Shall I Poop, which you co-authored, which we've also read, incidentally. So, <laughs> Where Shall I Poop? That's my masterpiece. Yes, thank you for asking that question. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think working in advertising, you have multiple briefs on your table and um, you're doing five things at once from, uh, yeah, baby care to insurance to uh, cars or whatever. And uh, I kind of kept that in my uh, creative writing as well. I have multiple projects. So at the moment, it's the insects and, and the new book and so on. Um, it's the same... And I really did enjoy researching how animals poop and writing this. And it's a surprisingly effective potty training book. And I think if your book can, and can do that, I mean, that's more than yeah, literary fiction can possibly do. Um, it, I th you're still using the same. You're using a pencil, in my case, and an A3 pad and, uh, and your thoughts. I think it's the same. It's the same process. And you go through that panic and then the first draft. And so it's the same thing. I just think, yeah, different subjects. So um, insects are as fascinating as, as ghosts are. And um, uh, I don't see it as, um, as diversity. I think in the end, you could argue it's the same story over and over again. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I have a wide range of curiosities and interests uh, from, yeah, excrement to cricket. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there was a hand right at the back. Um, and then I think the lady in front. Hi. So you mentioned in between that, had you been living in Jaffna, your life would have turned in a different way. Do you think it really helps when an author puts thousands of miles between his homeland and the current residence? Um, I guess it depends on the writer. and um, Because I, I've lived away from Sri Lanka for periods of time uh, in London, in Singapore, and, and in New Zealand. Um, I tried writing about those places, and I felt, one, did I have permission to do so? And um, also, it's, you know, you write a murder mystery set in London. You're, you're, you're certainly not the first or the last to do that. And so I often, when I'm, when I'm overseas, I do come up with ideas for stories and so on. But... The actual writing takes place mostly in Sri Lanka. For some reason, you need to, well, I need to be there listening to people talking and, uh, you know, smelling the air and so on. So I think distance is good, uh, though, I, you know, I haven't been writing much on the road so far. But I guess, yeah, you, you think you can see your country looks a lot more scarier from outside than it does from the inside. You know, when I was earlier this year, I was in Iowa while the Aragale was happening. I was getting heart palpitations looking at that stuff. And then now I'm living uh, in the situation, it doesn't seem as bad. And um, so I think a mix of both, but um, I, I feel I, I, I do need to be on the ground. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what was your process of navigating this uh, discussion on homosexuality? Uh, sensitive yet important discussion on homosexuality in a country that has not fully accepted queer culture yet? 
Yeah, so I, I perhaps would have thought a lot harder about it if I was writing it now, because I was thinking about this in 2013, and I think the, yeah, the cultural appropriation uh, debate hadn't quite uh, reached the fever pitch it is now. And um, I just, I mean, that's what Mali was, and I just, um, I, I did my research, and I did, and I got the, the story vetted by, uh, you know, gay men who had been around you that period and currently, but... Um, I, I probably would be a lot more cautious now about it, but I, I mean, I de debate whether you could say it's a gay novel. I certainly don't think it is. I think it's um, it just a character happens to this happens to be their sexuality. Um, but the fact is, we're writing about eighty nine, and it it seemed to add, for me it was just seemed to add up with the plot that this uh, man had many secrets and literally had a box under his bed, and so this all worked as a metaphor as well, and it just. I didn't think too deeply about it, and I went. Uh, I was cautious and careful, but I, I didn't, and uh, maybe I would now. Um, but um, I think it. I, I well, I hope it accurately portrays what it was like uh, to be a gay man in Sri Lanka at that time. But yeah. Thank you. Mm. Uh, the green Good morning, sir. Uh, my question to you is, um, provided the book is a political satire in certain senses, um, how was the reaction of the Sri Lankans upon the release of the book, uh, now that there has been a gap of almost three decades since the war and the release? Well, so now, I mean, the book happened uh, three months ago, and I guess people have now had time to buy the book and because the book didn't arrive for a while because uh, we uh, you know books are not essential services you need petrol and fuel before so it took a while to be there in the market and now i guess people have read it and there's been reactions to it um, you get i mean it's predominantly been positive but you do get uh, a few trolls who uh, and and this allegation happens to when a, a sri lankan film does well at um, at can or and and it's depicting the war in a not very flattering way. Well, how else to depict wars? And, um, but there is this idea that um, why are you bringing up the past and why are you selling this idea of Sri Lanka as a killing field to the West in order to win prizes? So you get a few um, trolls like that. And um, to me, it's, I mean, it's not a literary critic. It's just saying, I don't like your politics and therefore you're doing it for, to win awards and, and so on. So yeah, there has been, but I, I'm saying that's a, that's a real minority. Um, I think... What I have found is like a lot of young readers are talking about that period and, and, and discussing it, and I've s seen that in letters. So uh, again, the question, do we engage with our past or do we pretend it didn't happen? So you'll get different reactions, but I think it seems that most Sri Lankans are, are willing to engage with their past and, and learn from it instead of going through the same cycle over again. Uh, but yeah, there'll always be haters, yeah. The gentleman in glasses. Yeah. Hi, hi. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work, and uh, thank you so much for the talk today. I'm a speculative fiction writer myself, and uh, I just want to ask you a question on plot and character. So you mentioned that sometimes you make like a five-page biopic on characters and how you revised uh, your plot after 2020. But I just want to know how you go about it in the sense, do you imagine where the character will be at the end, and then you make the plot on the basis of that? Or do you have some sort of a structure in mind, and then you adjust the character accordingly so that the character arc sort of matches where they need to be in the end? Yeah, so no, I stopped this five-page bio thing. Uh, I, I, and yeah, I don't know how useful. It's, uh, it's all, a lot of these things are procrastinations. Um, so I know some writers do have the character arc mapped out or know roughly where they end up. Um, no, I don't. I, usually, I just give them a couple of traits um, and... Um, you know, the usual screenwriting formula, um, what do they want and what's the obstacle and so on. And uh, you give them a funny hat. That's from Neil Gaiman. Every character has to have a funny hat, uh, maybe uh, how they walk or their hideous laugh or something. And that's all I go in with. And, and then in the situation, the characters, the interesting ones come alive, the other ones sort of fall away. And so that's how, and then you find out where the character's going and, and then maybe a semblance of arc happens. But it takes longer this way. It'd be nice if you could have it all plotted out, but this is the way I do it. And then once you have a few drafts, then you realize, okay, that's what this character is about, and you think of their voice. But yeah, I think going with less and just jam is yeah the way I do it. Yeah. Oh, the lady at the back. Yeah. 
Good morning, sir. So, just this question, like, uh, you know, as you stated, working in advertising or, you know, say anything related to the field of media and even photography. What happens is there becomes a sense of hustle and there's always, we are, I'm not sure if you have dealt with it, the purpose of making content, of having something. I just wanted to know how do you go back from something like that and focus on something very sensitive as such a political discourse because our ideology becomes very narrow when we are just finding, a, you know, as uh, today's word, content. So just how do we go back and focus on something that's more important and wider sense? Thank you. If I understand it, so you're talking about now advertise where we're creating content versus writing, writing a book. Um, I guess it's all now. It's all called content. No, um, I don't. Again, I don't see a big separation. I don't like. For me, um, the 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 only uh, sort of contradiction comparison was in advertising. You you know you're doing it for a living, and you're you're telling what are they called now? Alternative facts. You're telling. I mean, let's call it. You're telling lies, and you're trying to pretend that they are truthful, and. Uh, the viewer knows that and you're playing this game whereas fiction it's the opposite thing uh, you're saying this is a lie there's talking leopards in this book there's demons this stuff didn't happen but yet hopefully there's something truthful about human emotions and uh, and and sri lanka or whatever the subject so i i don't see a contradiction between the two i think you're just playing different sides of the street yeah i think we could just have one last question sir you talked earlier about integrating humor into grim situations as a necessity. How do you do that without dealing a disservice to the tragedy? How do you laugh in tragedy without laughing at tragedy? Yeah, that's a tough one and I never consider that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, laughing at or... Uh, it's a fine line and I think the way you do it is you hide behind a character that's very unlike yourself and then you can say, well, no, it's not me. That guy's got a poor taste in humor and yeah, what an ass. But, you know, thank, thank heaven I'm not like that. I think that's, that's the way I do it. But um, yeah, no, it is a fine line that you're not trivializing things. Um, and also, but the fact that I think these these acts of violence are done with such impunity and, and are so widespread that it just seems like uh, laughing at it is the only way you, you can make sense of it. And I, yeah, but I think that, that's, that's the way I do it. I just hide behind characters. But yeah, it is, it is a consideration that you should make maybe on the, the final draft, but perhaps not when you're doing it. Because when you analyze a joke too much before you construct it, I don't think it kind of lands. So. Um, I think both the characters, Mali Almeida and W.G. Karnasan, they went for the punchline rather than the insight. And I think, yeah, um, that's them, not me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shehan. A huge round of applause for Shehan Karunathilika and Nadini Nair for this session. As a token of our appreciation, please accept these cards from us. There is.